Good, mo <coughs> Good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here on this occasion uh, in support of this uh, study of the Victorian economy for the Future Economy Group. Uh, I think this is a very significant, very important piece of work. Uh, it's very much a start in terms of some of the work that needs to be done in this area. And I think it sits particularly at odds with a recent statement by our Prime Minister when he was in Canada <coughs> excuse me, and the United States when he was asked about climate change and he said that he didn't want to, he thought it was an important issue, but he didn't want to clobber the economy and destroy jobs. And I think this study makes the point that that is not the case at all. It does not need to be a trade-off between growth and employment on the one hand and responding adequately to climate change on the other. Indeed, it's been my very strong view for the last uh, 15 years or so that uh, in fact there are enormous business opportunities in a sensible response to climate change. And I've uh, been involved in a number of businesses which I'll talk about briefly shortly that I think demonstrate that point. When I was a, uh, an academic, I used to teach economic modelling, uh, macroeconomic modelling. I used to say to my students, what conclusion would you like to reach? And I'll build you the model that will prove it. And to some extent that uh, facetious uh, remark is, is fairly accurate because today when you go around the public debate about climate change or uh, <clears throat> where the Australian or Victorian or other economies are heading, Everybody's got their own model, and they, those models, as it surprisingly, uh, proves the point that they all want to make. But I think the, this is very significant work because it has taken a very objective view uh, of natural capital in Victoria, makes the point in very simple terms, and Ian will go into, of course, the detail, but it makes the point that if you manage natural capital well and efficiently, uh, you can have both more jobs and more growth. And so I think it's a very important study from that point of view. It certainly kicks off the debate that we should be having in this country as to how to look after the environment, to how to manage efficiently our natural capital, and how to have an eye to the future as to which industries are likely to grow and develop, and how we can capitalise on that. I mentioned that uh, I've been involved in a number of businesses. We started a group back in the about 1999-2000 called the Business Leaders Forum on Sustainable Development. Our aim was to try and educate the business community as to the opportunities that would be there if um, <coughs> there was a sensible response to climate change, independently of course of what governments would do in response to that challenge. And there wasn't a lot of business interest, I must say, for several years in that group. Uh, we pretty much met amongst ourselves, our annual conference was fairly poorly attended until we brought uh, Al Gore to Australia about eight years ago, who we found was dispensed with as a failed politician and a mere entertainer. But he did give a speech in, uh, on our behalf, which is very much an inconvenient truth, the movie that he subsequently released, and of course had a substantial impact on the global debate about climate change. And through that process, I personally thought that I saw a number of business opportunities that we could demonstrate the point that, uh, that um, a sensible response to climate change could uh, give you a very profitable business response. Uh, in 2000, we launched an exercise in New South Wales to build the first household garbage recycling plant at Eastern Creek. I went to see Bob Carr, as it was, as the Premier then, on the first day of the Olympics, and said that I thought that landfilling of garbage was a barbaric practice, and that um, i take the finance risk and the technology risk if he could guarantee me 25 years of garbage supply. And we did. And we, we demonstrated that you could make a profitable business out of treating garbage properly, separating each of the main items of paper, the, the glass, the plastic, the metal and so on, but importantly taking the methane gas out of the garbage in a 24-hour period, turning that methane into electricity, using that to run the plant and to sell the rest into the grid. But it was a viable business in and, in and of itself. Of course, if the government were to come in and uh, have a sensible system for pricing carbon, it would be an additional income stream in a business like that. I went on to build another business in energy efficient light bulbs, one of the very first companies to launch focused in that area. In the third business, we built the largest biodiesel plant in the world in Singapore. 
uh, again demonstrating that uh, there are viable business opportunities from a sensible response to climate change. <clears throat> and I think the thinking in this report demonstrates that if you actually focus on this as an issue, you can see the upside, you can see the potential, and you can start to understand which industries will benefit from a sensible response <clears throat> to climate change. If governments then over and above that on a global basis come to an emissions uh, reduction agreement or a global price on carbon or some mechanism to that effect, it's only going to add particular value to some of these decisions that are made. I think the interesting thing about this report though is that although it's, as I say, it's just the beginning, uh, what you really need to do is stage two and beyond uh, and look at some of the specific sectors in more detail to understand the nature of the specific opportunities that exist. I mentioned those businesses that I was involved in. They're all very rudimentary in a technology sense, first generation technology if you like. The big gains come from, of course, second and third and fourth. And fifth generation technological exercises where you improve what you're doing. And that's what I see that you can do with this study. You can take this study as an umbrella study and then look at the specific sectoral opportunities within it and I'd encourage those behind this to continue to fund this sort of work to actually look at some of those sectors which are identified in the broad in the study, but of course not in detail. My final point is to say that um, a key element of all this is investment. And um, one of the exercises I'm presently involved in is called the Asset Owners Disclosure Project, where we decided to move beyond government looking at the issue of climate change we have identified the top 1,000 uh, <coughs> superannuation and pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, insurance companies in the world, university endowment funds, I guess, as well, which in total, that 1,000 account for about 70 trillion US dollars worth of investment money assets under management. They have a long-term fiduciary responsibility to maximise the return in those pension funds to the benefit of their superannuation fund members, and I've noticed that Big Super is a big supporter of, uh, of this study. Uh, but what we do is survey and rate them as to how they're managing climate change and uh, ask them the question as to why they are so heavily exposed in carbon ex to carbon-exposed industries. Of that uh, 1,000, they control, as I said, about 70 trillion US dollars worth of funds. They are by far and away the largest asset mobilisers, investors in the world. They control more than 50% of all the listed companies and all the stock exchanges of the world. But collectively, they invest about 55% of those funds in carbon exposed industries, and only 2% of those funds in low carbon intensive industries. That is a massive punt, a 55 to 2 punt against climate change directly impacting on the value of some of those assets or government responses or technology in time changing the value of those assets. Because many of those assets risk, become, risk becoming standard. They risk um, falling in share prices, falling infrastructure values and so on. And that 55 to 2 pump I think is very significant. It would be good to see them adjust their exposure to climate change by investing more in low carbon intensive industries, raise that 2% to say 5 or 6% and you'd have enough funds globally I think to fund the sort of technological revolution I think there should be in response to climate change. In the businesses that I mentioned it was tough getting investment dollars to build those businesses and I think if uh, there was a more enlightened response to climate change in a sense, in a portfolio sense, I'm not arguing the ethical case I'm arguing a portfolio exposure case. If you've got a 55 to 2 punt, it dwarfs the significance, both as individual institutions and systemically, it dwarfs the exposure that was there in the subprime crisis, for example. And in time, it will become a major issue that will need to be dealt with. So I think these sort of studies against that sort of background are very important because they will start institutions thinking about where the economy can go or should go in, in terms of future directions and where the business opportunities will be and where some of those investment dollars can be challenged. So in simple terms, I'm delighted to be here today to have this opportunity to back this study. I think it's a very important study. I might finish by, I guess, by quoting Winston Churchill, but this is certainly not the end. It's not even 
<coughs> the beginning of the end. It perhaps is the end of the beginning. Thank you.